All right, ladies and gentlemen, if you'll make your way back to your seats, we will start the next panel in just a moment. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you all don't mind making your way back to your seats, we're going to go ahead and start this next panel right now, and then we'll break for lunch right after this panel. So as our panelists start to come on up, this panel is the Innovative Energy Development Technologies Panel. This panel discussion will center around innovative energy development technologies and their potential to revolutionize power generation and the energy economy in South Carolina. The goal of this panel, one that I'm very excited about, is to offer valuable insights into successful energy development strategies and the pivotal role of innovation and technology in expanding energy capacity to meet growing demands of economic development projects here in South Carolina. So with that, I will turn it over to former Congressman Gresham Barrett. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Everybody's still on coffee break. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for it. I, I see a few people kind of settling back in, but, but thank you. It's always a, a kind of a dangerous thing to have a session just before lunch. But uh, this is the, the biggest group and by far the most important group uh, of the morning. So, gentlemen, thank you for being here. Governor, um, for you and your leadership, uh, for your staff, thank you. And, and I mean that with all my heart. Energy has been a passion for a long time for me. And there's a lot of people in politics that don't get it. You know that. You get it. You and your team get it. And this is important, not only for South Carolina to be a national leader, but an international leader. I just finished a stint with Governor Beasley, as you well know, traveling the nation, traveling the world. People don't have power. Uh, and what we do here can be transferred internationally to so many, hundreds of millions of people. So thank you for doing this. Um, I'm Gresham Barrett, former congressman. There's nothing more former than a former congressman. I can tell you that much right now. But uh, it's, it, is, it is a real pleasure to be here today. Uh, so thank you. And, and I was, as I was reading this panel, what it's all about, and I thought, oh, what the heck is this about? Um, two words came to mind, game changers. These are, ga these are game changers here. We're not going to talk about, we, we might talk a little bit about policy, but these are game changers. This can, can, can change the, the landscape of not only South Carolina, but the world. And, and it's exciting to see that. So what I'm going to do first, I'm going to introduce my panel and just go down the list here. And then I'm going to give them a few minutes. I'm going to give them a, a really open-ended question just to kind of to, to, to talk about what they do and what they can bring to the, to the stage. So I'm real excited. Um, first, we've got Chris Goosen, Director, Advanced Reactor Product Management in Westinghouse. Chris, thank you. Appreciate you wearing the jacket today. It's real good. Uh, Guillaume 
Senior Vice President for Power Systems and Digital Power with Schneider Electric. Baha Yedke, Chief Executive Officer, Promega Energy Storage Technology, Pomega, excuse me. Stephen Capps, Senior VP, Nuclear Operations, Duke Energy, South Carolina. Uh, and last but not least, Noel Black, Senior VP of Federal Regulatory Affairs for the Southern Company. Gentlemen, thank you for being here today. So let me open it up um, for a, a real open-ended question here. What I want you to do is talk about your impact uh, in South Carolina for your company, what you do, okay? Uh, and, and then the other thing is I want you to, 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 to kind of mold into that. We talk about energy independence. What can you do to help with energy independence? We've talked about this a long time, but this is not only in South Carolina, but for the nation. So, Chris, start us off. Good, good, good. So, uh, first off, <clears throat> I appreciate everyone um, giving me the opportunity to be here. You know, I debate which way I go about the shirt comment, the jacket comment. Do I say Steve Jobs can wear a turtleneck, or do I just openly admit I forgot it? <laughs> and I'll let you guys decide which way I go with that. Um, you talk about passion for energy and nuclear, and it's something we were talking back. Uh, I'm a Westinghouse legacy. My parents worked for Westinghouse, uh, so I've been around this for a while, and I'm certainly passionate about nuclear. Um, answer the question, I kind of want to frame it in a little bit of three ways, right? First off, of, you know, the Westinghouse history. Um, Westinghouse has been in nuclear since its inception uh, in America, right? The first commercial nuclear reactor shipping port outside my hometown is a Westinghouse design. Um, 450 operating reactors around the world are based on Westinghouse pressurized water technology. Um, we have been able to not only develop the technology, but proliferate it throughout the world through some of our collaborations. Um, and then what does it look like? What have we been doing, right? So obviously those plants need support. They need fuel, they need engineering to keep maintaining them, uh, which is a core of our business. And what that looks like in South Carolina today, is, it's been mentioned a number of times, uh, the fuel fabrication facility located whatever miles from here. Um, we talked about the employment there, 800 plus people, it's long history in South Carolina, 50 years. Um, but one of the most, I think, telling aspects of that and its impact on the economy here is 10% of the electricity produced in the United States is powered by the fuel that's produced in South Carolina, the nuclear fuel that's produced in South Carolina. Uh, that impact is huge. Um, a little bit lesser known is when we talk about our engineering services, one of our main hubs, our global hubs for engineering work, is based in Rock Hill, South Carolina. It's our southeast hub. It's where we do the bulk of our electrical engineering um, and our balance of plant engineering. High paying, good quality jobs located in the region. And so we have a foundation of supporting nuclear. And, and when we look at what can we do for the future of nuclear, we really look at, at a portfolio of products, right? Not all customers are demanding the same thing. Um, on the large scale, we have the AP1000 technology, 1200 gigawatts borderline, large base load technology to support a number of applications. Um, growing interest across Europe, obviously driven by some of the security concerns there. Um, China has announced additional waves of the plants and progressing with it and, and phenomenal operational performance from that plant. Uh, obviously meets a demand at a larger scale. One of the more innovative technologies that we're looking at is to address some of the more global aspects and some of the more remote aspects that, that nuclear hasn't typically served. Our Vinci micro reactors, five megawatts, right? Compare that to a SMR or a gigawatt scale, significantly smaller. But what this is allowing us to do is to bring nuclear to remote communities. It's allowing us to bring nuclear to mining communities. It's allowing us to decarbonize uh, typically um, highly emitting industries where you can't bring some of the larger scale nuclear. Um, and then last but not least, something that I think I'll expand on more later is, is our new announcement, our small modular reactor, our AP300. Um, we just recently were able to announce it uh, about a month ago, but we've been developing it for close to two years now. Um, and the fundamental is tying back to that portfolio of solutions is 
We know that there are some customers that aren't looking for the gigawatt scale technology right now, and they're looking for something in a small modular reactor. Um, so from a vendor perspective, what we're really trying to do is look at what our demands are and how do we provide the right technology to do that. And what should go without saying is that as we keep increasing the nuclear, it's almost a direct proportional increase in the influx of work into South Carolina, right? As we build more nuclear, the technologies are based off of the same fuel being produced in South Carolina today. More fuel coming out of South Carolina, more engineering work coming out of South Carolina, uh, more O&M, more operational aspects coming out of South Carolina. So, we'll see. Fantastic. Thank you, Michael. Yep. Guillaume Schneider, talk to us. Well, hey, good morning, everyone. It's very difficult to follow the nuclear scientists here, so <laughs> I'm going to still try to tell you about innovation and disruption. And um, you might wonder, hey, w who's Schneider Electric? Well, first, we have the electric in the name, so at least we're in the, in the right panel here. Uh, we are a global corporation, uh, about 150,000 across the world. 20,000 of them are in the US. And what we do is we're trying to make everyone smarter from generation to consumption about what we do with these electrons. Look, we're in this room today. We're all together in this room today. And there's plenty of electrons around us right now. There's electrons in these lights. There's electrons in a chiller outside that's keeping us cool. There's electrons behind these screens here. And one thing is not all these electrons are equal they are not all equally critical to all of us right now. And guess what? There's also a ton of electrons across this facility that are continuously wasted, used for purposes that we don't really care about. What Schneider tries to do with his technology is to make that visible, understandable, and actionable. We have technologies that can allow all of us as users, as generators, as utility grid operators, to be smarter about what we use, what we consume, and when. Because Director Edwards was mentioning this morning, we are in a race that is very, very difficult to win for this state. You're building new generation facilities, but you're bringing all this new business that is accelerating the need for consumption much faster than what you can build. And we believe that the solution is by using what we have smarter and better, making it more efficient. So in the state, Schneider is present across the state. We have, it's the sixth largest footprint we have across the US. We have 1,200 employees working between our sites of Columbia, Seneca, and a few other commercial offices. Well, we are investing and we want to grow and help this state to meet the demand, meet the growth that they're seeing and supporting the energy transition. Very happy to be with you. Thanks, thanks, Guillaume. And, and, and you bring up an important point. I know I've heard the governor say every toolbox, every tool in the toolbox. Correct. Every tool in the toolbox. I'll, I'll go deeper into how we make this technology Good. happen through sensors, through technology, through software, through apps. Uh, and what is interesting, it's, it's every scale. So you might have heard my title is I'm, I'm in charge of power systems. What systems are is large buildings. But really, it doesn't stick only to large buildings. We're all consumers here, in our house first, with your car, whether, by the way, it's an electric one or not. We're all consumers of energies everywhere along the process, and there's always an action you can do as a citizen, as a manager of an organization, or as a manager of, uh, or as a contributor in a community. There's everything you can do, and we'll bring some of that to you today. That's awesome. Baja, Pomega. Good, good morning. Uh, I, of course, uh, being among these industry giants is not difficult for a company like us. It's not, it's not easy for a company like us. Uh, we don't have those kind of capacities, but we are a kind of a representing a unique a niche of the industry here. Uh, we, will be, uh, we will be manufacturing lithium ferrous phosphate batteries in uh, South Carolina soon enough, hopefully. And uh, we are uh, differentiating from the other battery companies in, the, in this beautiful state by being the one who focuses on the uh, grid level applications. So this is the utility scale applications. We call it the stationary storage. 
So uh, we, we will not be only manufacturing the battery cells, but also turnkey sim systems and uh, serve as an integrator as well in many cases. So we will be uh, serving uh, to the different sides of the industry uh, with different kind of uh, products and services. Uh, our technology uh, will provide, uh, first of all, uh, a capability to go uh, to net zero goals. So we, now, nowadays, uh, we, ha we have to think more seriously about reaching our net, net zero goals and uh, harnessing the energy, c capturing the energy and storing the energy uh, is a vital tool in that. I mean, without energy storage, talking about a net zero goal uh, is uh, quite impossible. So uh, our, our technologies will, uh, uh, will just make that possible. And uh, in general, what we will do is we will also help uh, with healthier uh, grid systems by uh, regulating the frequencies uh, and of course, shaving the peak loads, that is always a problem for the grid. Uh, and not only for the resilience part, but storage also helps for the welfare of the grid system as well, which is very well needed, especially in our country. Uh, and uh, Pomega, Pomega will be a, 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 one, of, one of the a leaders in the market by developing these technologies to serve more and to serve better. So, uh, in, in general, the uh, energy storage uh, in utility scale uh, will, will be uh, as important as the, uh, the battery needs for the EV industry, and we will be one of the pioneers. We are so proud to be one of the pioneers here, especially uh, working in this uh, beautiful state, uh, trying to just add value to the, to the uh, progress, uh, technological progress in this state as well. So awesome. I'm, I'm so gr grateful to be here. Thanks a lot. Awesome. Baja, thank you. Stephen Caps with Duke, who um, grew up together. We did. Up in Oconee County, Westminster, South Carolina, to be specific. Good to see you, my friend. Of course. So I'm Stephen Caps. I'm the Senior Vice President of Nuclear Operations for our South Carolina plant. So I am responsible for the operation of our six nuclear units at three locations uh, in South Carolina. And, and I will tell you all, I'm not a policy guy. I'm a plant guy, right? So I'm a lot, I'm a lot more comfortable if we're talking about pumps or valves or turbines than, than uh, talking about policy. But I've learned a lot about the policy piece because that, that's going to define the future. Uh, for, for all of us. Uh, I said, I said six, six plants, three sites, about 5,700 uh, megawatts. If, if I just think about the, the direct economic impact, a nuclear plant is an economic <coughs> engine in and of itself. So just for nuclear in South Carolina, we've got about 2,200 employees. Uh, if you just look at the tax base for nuclear, it's about $140 million. So, and, and then you've got all the things that go with the plant and, and, uh, and around the plant. So a, 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 significant, a, a, a significant benefit there. And, and then the other thing I would say, because I, I would be doing my folks a, a disservice if I didn't mention it, is, you know, those 2,200 people are actively involved in the community from a volunteer donation, go to a school, go to a ball field, go to a church, and, and that contribution is part of what also makes South Carolina such a, such a great place to live and such a great place to do business. Uh, just relative to the, to the energy independence piece, we talk about operational excellence, which to us means be safe, be reliable, and be cost effective. And in the near term, I think that's our contribution to that energy independence. Fantastic. Stephen, thank you. No, finish it up, big boy. Sure, sure. So, so I am a policy guy, and he won't let me touch any of these pumps or anything else, so I appreciate that very much. Governor, thanks for inviting us in, inviting me in to, to have this conversation. Um, listen, I, um, 
I'll talk to you a little bit from Southern Company, and I do federal regulatory affairs for Southern Company, so I look across the country at what's going on and what's working and what's not and why, frankly, why the Southeast is working so well and how do we preserve that, right? So I'll talk to you a little bit, sort of a macro perspective on some of this and, and from a policy perspective um, to ensure all the innovation that these guys are doing and working on actually comes and inures to the benefit of our customers and new customers to come, which y'all are doing an incredible job on that, so thank you. So, so, so again, sort of a, a, a regional look. First, I like our cards. I love the cards of the region, right? Um, we, we've done a lot right, and we're doing a lot more right, and if you look at the legacy of innovation in the nuclear, just here in South Carolina, six units in this state, that's remarkable, that's fantastic. Uh, the region itself has a lot of nukes, adding, adding a few uh, and preserving all of them. Hydro, another one, right? These are, these are incredible resources for our customers from a reliability and affordability and sustainability, which we heard earlier, is a more and more important part of the, the conversation. Um, today, it's gas and solar. It's coming at us, it's beautiful, it's wonderful. It also takes innovation to get it on the system the way we need it. If you look at solar, and there's a wave of it coming. It's coming here, it's coming, but the southeast writ large, North Carolina, Georgia, Florida are three of the top six solar developing states in the country, right? It's a, uh, it's a fantastic resource. It has its operational realities, and we have to figure out a way to make sure it's on for the benefit of our customers. So you see innovations like SEAM, or the Southeastern Energy Exchange Market, to make sure we never interrupt it, that it's on, and our customers see the, both the environmental benefits but also the economic benefits of solar. So that's today. Gas, we saw this last winter storm. Uh, we have a, 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 our region and the way we operate structurally, we have a lot of firm gas pipelines. That's a, a huge benefit for us. And our structure allows and enables that. We need more. <laughs> we need more. Our um, annual burn, let's fast forward 20 years may start to shrink year over year. Our annual net burn, our capacity requirements, I mean, they could double. We're retiring coal, there's a lot going on here. Winter peaks require capacity. Love solar, but it's 7 a.m., right? We've gotta have some other, other solutions there. So it takes, back to structure, the ability to engineer and design a system to deal with that. So when I say things like that, I'm thinking more about the regulatory process and the IRP process and the ability to design and engineer a fleet that fits together with all these new innovations. That's, that's pretty, uh, in my view, incredibly necessary. Um, the four innovations I think about sort of in the, in the long term, nuclear, SMRs, long duration storage here, we're, I mean, we got them all represented here. Um, hydrogen is another one that's, that's out there and carbon sequestration, right? Sequestration is going to be a I think a big deal for us is gonna require, again, more gas infrastructure, something we gotta think about. That's, those are longer term opportunities. Near term solar and gas now, uh, and then longer term, some more of those, those types of solutions. Which ones are gonna work, I'm not sure. Uh, I think we need to continue to invest and understand wh where and how they might add to our system. Um, but it's gonna take, again, some engineering and designing in a regulatory structure that, that allows and enables that to occur. So, um, again, love our cards. It's not by accident that our region is in the situation it's in. It's by design. Mm -hmm. The visible arm of regulation versus the invisible hand of sort of capacity competition that, frankly, the other parts of the world or the country are, are trying to figure that out right now. So, I like where we are. And, uh, I love that these guys are developing all this stuff for the benefit of our customers. Good job, thank you, my friend. Okay, let me hit just a few specifics. We'll take some questions from me. <laughs> I'm not answering questions, I'm just giving them. And then we'll take a few from the, 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 the crowd out here. Steve, homeboy, what's Duke doing today in nuclear? Um, and what are you doing for prospective business? You and I grew up in the shadow of the Oconee nuclear plant. So uh, talk to me. So, I, I mean, I'll go back to what I said earlier because it's the foundation for us is, is operational excellence. Operate the plants safely, operate them uh, reliably, and, and be cost effective. And 
relative to adding, adding value, I would tell you, we don't just operate plants, but we operate plants well, and that in and of itself adds value. If you look at the capital investment of the plant, it is what it is. And by and large, the operating cost is fixed. So the more reliable, the more predictable outages are, the more output, the, the, the better it is uh, from an economic standpoint for, for the customer. So we, we, we benefit from that. There was a discussion about, about how, many, how many units. If you, if you just look at, at the generation in the Carolinas, 50 to 60%, depending on which year, it'll be in that range of our power comes from comes from or from nuclear so it's the key to, to to energy generation and to the to the energy prices that that we're able to provide to to support the the economic growth and and just i mean relative to a a perspective on economics and the value to business i kind of go back to our mission statement that we tell our folks on an ongoing basis is we generate clean, life-essential electricity around the clock to power the lives of our community. So that's kind of the fundamental for us. Thank you, my friend. Baja. Pomega chose South Carolina to be a flagship in manufacturing with uh, battery storage systems. What, why South Carolina, my friend? All right. That, that has a long story, actually, but, you know, first of all, I have to tell that Pomega is a U.S. entity, but it has a Turkish parent. So uh, it, was, it was not an easy uh, task. Uh, what we have done, we, we, we have hired a, a professional company to help us with the site selection process, and then we started uh, our uh, kind of search uh, with 19 states shortlisted. And in, in time, uh, we have vetted more than 200 sites for this purpose and finally decided in South Carolina, in Colleton County. Uh, we had a very complex kind of a, a matrix that we were working on, and we have worked on that for seven months. First, our major concern was the human resources. Uh, that was the top the criteria that we, we were concerned about. But later on in time, in the United States, we have figured out that power is the actual leading concern, the available power that we, because our power requirements are really high compared to a facility like the one that we're gonna build. It's, it's only 650,000 square feet, which, which will just go up to one million uh, when we reach the top capacity and we need 35 uh, megawatts of power available, and which was not available anywhere. So when we were checking, uh, and uh, uh, honestly speaking, I didn't go to every site uh, to check it myself, but uh, I was available to come to South Carolina, and I was a little bit frustrated with this power situation going on because whenever we had the labor, we didn't have the power. Whenever we had uh, other uh, positive, uh, criteria in place, we didn't have the power. And finally, I was really frustrated and finally we were checking the site at Colleton County. Uh, and uh, right now, uh, I call him as a friend, dear uh, Mark uh, Walling from uh, Coastal Electric, just told me uh, that we got the power. And that was music to my ears. <laughs> I mean, I, I just, uh, we, were, we, were, we were scheduled to go to Oklahoma and Arizona from here because they were the other two contenders. Uh, and I just canceled it. Uh, I said, we found a place because, you know, we got the power here. That's, that's so important. And of course, it's not the only thing. I mean, uh, we, we had a very uh, promising kind of a labor pool in the area that will serve us. And uh, equally important, we had the avail availability of uh, credible uh, universities that will help us with our research and development uh, and also uh, will help us uh, with a, a reliable kind of technical uh, personnel flow. So uh, above all those came the wonderful people of South Carolina the welcome we have here, which is very important. 
the, everybody was welcoming us, welcoming our bu business, and what could we ask for more? I mean, so that was that was a love at first sight, and here we are, and we are so still very happy uh, with our choice. Awesome. We're glad to have you too. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Chris, one of the most exciting things I've seen come down the pike is the SMR. Um, I was talking to uh, John Hart, who is in charge of an organization out of D.C. called C3 Solutions. He's working on an initiative, I think it's called Farmers and Ranchers for Nuclear, where they can say, I've got a piece of land outside Columbia, South Carolina, that's soybeans, here's 10 acres, put an SMR on here, uh, and let's work together because it's a win-win-win. Talk to us a little bit about, and you mentioned it a little bit earlier, AP300. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, what I it starts with what I talked about before, our, our portfolio of solutions, right? And um, prior to the launch, about a month of ago, it was pretty clear that we had products at the thousand gigawatts, uh, thousand megawatts, and five megawatts. And when we made the decision that we were missing that product, that the customers want something in that SMR range for for the reasons you mentioned, um, we started with what what do we believe that product should look like and out of that came the AP300, and, and a big foundation of that is what Steve mentioned, is, is trying to ensure that operational success, right? Starting with products, starting with technology that we know works and that we have, and, and that we diverge from that technology, we, we introduce first-of-a-kind risk only when it's smart, right? Only when it's gonna return a, a benefit for a cheaper plant or a more effective plant for, for deployment. So that's the strategy we've taken with AP300. It's been an exciting ride for um, the last, you know, handful of months that we've been out there talking. Um, it's a technology that, that I'm extremely excited uh, about. I think it can meet a need um, that is missing with large nuclear. And, mm. and I think as we engage and talk to utilities, uh, end users, and, and some end users that aren't typical nuclear users, yeah. um, it, it's an interesting time and exciting for all of us. And, and one of the panels earlier, they were talking about land restrictions too. <coughs> You can do it on a much smaller footprint, correct? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and if you look at one of our foundational technology approaches is we drive at a small compact footprint to start with. Um, it, it's, it's one of our governing guides to help bring our cost down. And that transitions inherently into the SMR of making it smaller, reducing our EPZ, and bringing nuclear closer to some of these applications. Absolutely. Great. Thank you, my friend. Guillaume, South Carolina and states across the country are benefiting from reshoring and new manufacturing for the clean energy industry. And help, help us with this one. How can digitization, right, and not only digit, digitization but electrification ensure that we meet our increased demands on the grid? Educate us a little bit. Well, we, we've just talked about new new type of generation technologies and they're they're vital we need to deploy these new generations because we need the extra load but the reality is the race of generation versus consumption is a very very tough one because consumption can go much faster moving 750,000 people from a state to another can be done just in a few months building a one gigawatt reactor that's going to power them is not a matter of months. And on top of that, you have two key trends that we all see every day that are accelerating. First on the grid. The grid used to be monodirectional. It is now clearly bidirectional. You have local generation, you have prosumers with solar, with battery systems. Companies are also becoming self-generation, bringing self-generation capabilities. So the grid is now more complex because it is a bi-directional entity that you have to manage. And the second key shift on us is, look, when I started in this industry 20 years ago, and someone would come and say, hey, Schneider needs to electrify a new factory. 20 years ago, my natural perception of what an industrial factory was was about 200,000 to 500,000 square feet. A factory that would have three to 500 employees. That was a standard. Today, we see these factories opening in this state that have a million, two million square feet. 
that are using the input in terms of, of megawatts of entry is massive. And we have, to, we have to size our answer and what we provide to the size of these factories. Just bear with me a second here, just an analogy. Can you picture um, an aquarium tank? And I give you some sand and I tell you, look, there's the exact same volume of sand than the aquarium, pour it inside. You're going to pour it nicely, it will go just to the top. Now if I try to do the same and I give you the same exact volume as the aquarium, but I give you big stones, you're going to start position them in the aquarium and you're going to run out of space because it won't optimize itself. This is a dilemma you have and we all have with so much infrastructure and industries coming into the state. They are big load of energy that are not, not constant and that you're going to have to handle. Now there's two technologies that will help us solve this equation. First one, and if you don't know these three words together, please feel free to contact us and we can refer you to many other organizations that are playing in this field. Energy management software. And I'll go a little bit deeper in what energy management software can do for, for all these entities, whether on the generation or the consumption side. And the second one is, you were mentioning technologies that are dif differentiated and disruptive for the future, microgrid. Microgrid is going to allow us to optimize certain parts of the state electrical consumption. Now on energy management software, let me give you a very tactical, precise example here. At Schneider, we have a facility that uh, Senator Light say, mentioned earlier that is based in um, Lexington, Kentucky. And it's a 64-year-old industrial facility, which um, I don't know if you know, but in the industrial sector, we count like in dog years, so 64-year-olds is very, very old. And we decided to make this facility better, more optimized, and to deploy all the technology, all the energy management software technology within the facility. So we put sensors, meters, that allow us to know where the electrons are and what they're used for. We then optimize for it, saying, hey, we don't need all this lighting here, we don't need all this power here. We optimize the whole plant through the process. We also track the water consumption. After two years of transformation, implementing all this technology, the plant now uses 26% less electrons, 26% less consumption yeah. in energy, 20% less in water, and 30% less in carbon impact on, on the environment. Wow. This is real. 64-year-old facility that was awarded the Lighthouse um, Award by, by the UN Nations. And it can be done everywhere. And what's really important to remember is we have Fantastically, in this state, 11 billion of investment are coming to the state. They're going to need new facilities. They're going to need new energy. Absolutely. So it's not only these new facilities that need to become efficient. It's all the existing one that needs to make room for them. In Kentucky, we managed to make room. 26% of the consumption is now available to other businesses. This is a game changer when you, mana when you manage the load at, a at the size of a state. That's awesome. Thank you. You're right. That is 26%. That's a game changer. That's a game changer. Thank you, my friend. Noel, Southern Company. Good golly, man. We, we, we talk about every tool in the toolbox, wind, water, solar, power, uh, um, uh, gas, the whole nine yards. Nuclear is always in there. And when you've got a state that's got the majority of its power coming from nuclear, talk to us about your positions, what does Southern Company think about nuclear long term? So obviously pretty bullish <laughs> on, on nuclear. We've got two units under construction, one's nearing uh, uh, coming online permanently through the year beyond 2100. 2100. I don't think I'll be here, but it'll, you know, it'll, it's, it'll still be on in the past 2100. That one unit, and y'all know these numbers too, but that one unit serves 500,000 homes. So the energy intensity associated with that one unit uh, is remarkable. The footprint of that one unit is remarkable. Its capabilities, somebody, someone used the word uh, on the earlier panel, the stiffness of the system. I love that, I'm gonna steal that going forward. But it's, it's units in the inertial power of, of 
uh, big units like that, that that bring a lot to us. And again, from a regional perspective, that we enjoy that, right? We get to uh, enjoy those sorts of resources. Um, the two the two other sort of near term opportunities that, uh, that we're facing right now, gas and the need for gas. Um, I think we've got to think about that, and I think we have a regional um, advantage, right? We can buy, firm, we, our regulators tend to require us to buy firm gas for our plants, CCs, our combustion turbines, and our combined cycle turbines. Firm gas uh, is what built the gas pipeline in America, right? We're one of the few regions left that, that strikes firm gas deals for gas delivery. So we have a pretty robust gas system now, but there are our future as we continue to, to evolve and, and likely retire coal over the next, what, 10, 15 years, that gas is, is going to be necessary, right? And, and again, uh, the structure of, our, of our, uh, our region, vertical integration and IRPs, all these wonky, sorry terms and such are so important to put us in position as a region to continue on this path to support other resources like solar, right? Solar is a fantastic resource. It's cheap. Um, it's obviously sustainable. We have a structure where, in, again, back to the structure in our region where our customers actually see the real price, the very low cost of those resources while they're on. And I never want to turn them off, right? Curtailments um, for uh, non-dispatchable resources, wind and solar. If you look across the country, this is certain areas are struggling to keep those resources on, right? They don't deliver their true benefit unless they're on. So we, companies in the Southeast, the entire Southeast, look for the, the reason or the, the ways we can keep those resources on and balance. We need gas, we need nuclear, we need the things to pressurize and create the stiffness in the system. So then we can, then we can add on resources like solar and make sure they never turn off, right? That is. Supply and demand stuff here, right? Macroeconomics. If I turn it off, it's more expensive. It's just not as, it's, if it's not producing, it's more expensive. There's a finite amount of these resources coming at us. We love solar, but the average solar facility is 1,200 mega, I'm sorry, 1,200 acres of utility scale solar, right? So there's, a, there's, a, there's an equilibrium that's, that's, that's likely going to happen because you have, you know, competition for the land, right? Uh, timber or, or farming or industrial, you know, customers, things like this. So there's an equilibrium coming. So the ones, the, the solar that we get, we want to make sure we're, we're utilizing. And back to circle this up, the intensity of a, of a nuclear unit, right, and the footprint it has for 1,100 megawatts, 90 some odd percent of the time available is remarkable. So we got to, it, it all has to fit together. And, and uh, as I said earlier, our car, the cards I like so much are, are um, they're not by accident. I mean, we have a structure that, that's carried us through and puts us in a wonderful position today, but the next 20 years is going to be amazing and a little scary, and we need a structure like this to help piece it all together so we can keep, in, you know, inviting amazing companies like this. And, and Schneider's, their, their ability to wring out value from the customer side and our side is, is fantastic. I mean, it's a, it's a very complex system, this electricity thing we do, and uh, the ability to wring out those, all the, the efficiencies we can to benefit everybody. So I uh, love, love working with Snyder on those issues. Absolutely. You know, again, every tool in the toolbox. But let me, let me go, let me just touch with, with Chris and Steve and, and, and Noel, back to you. Um, with nuclear, uh, when you think about the future like you're talking about and, and true baseload capacity, people keep mentioning nuclear, nuclear, and the expansion. There used to be a lot of pushback about nuclear with the nuclear waste, of course. Chris, let me go to you first. What are you hearing? Do you, is that kind of subsiding? Is it still strong? Kind of where is that now? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Sense? It does, yeah. And, and, you know, from a non-operating person, maybe I'll, I'll look at it from the design space. We, we do hear, right, there is continued, right, always a little bit of hope around the, the nuclear fuel. Sure. Um, but candidly, from our perspective, when we get into the discussions with the utilities and you get into the, the discussions with people, it's not there, right? So I think we throw around, and I, 
all of the nuclear waste that's been produced in America would stack up on a football field below the goal lines, below the uprights, to kind of characterize the volume of this. In, in Canada, I believe it's uh, below the rink of a hockey rink. So <laughs> just that we, we talk in both aspects. So the, the volume of this is, is small in our impression. We, we don't, from you know, kind of the utilities that want to develop this, we don't get that sense. Um, so that's why I look at it from a vendor standpoint. Good. And Steve? And I would say, Gresham, that the dynamic has changed. We certainly still talk about, about nuclear waste, but we, as an industry, and, and then within Duke, we have shown that we can safely and economically account for and store the waste in a manner that is uh, that, that's safe and, and, and uh, safe for the environment. And, and so I don't, I don't see that as an impediment to the ability to move forward. Good. No. I mean, I, I think the support, I mean, for us, y'all probably see it too, support for nuclear locally in and around our plants is enormous. It's safe, it's clean, incredible jobs, uh, and, you know, driver of economic development. So locally, it's, it's, it's probably the best locally. Nationally, uh, I think it's uh, my view. I'm in Washington, D.C. and have these conversations all the time with, with folks about all the various resources and, and the support for nuclear right now is, in, in, in my time doing this job is probably better than it's ever been, right? There's a recognition, again, that evolution, we just talked about the evolution of, uh, of uh, you know, electrification on top of sort of the greening of, of the way we do our business. Um, nuclear, I mean, it's, it's essential, it's absolutely essential. And I think uh, it's one of those inevitables uh, in life. I think the math and the, and the sort of uh, the, the benefit to our system is absolutely in inevitable. So I think folks are realizing that. Those who, you know, uh, sort of uh, reacted, you know, viscerally, you know, years ago or sort of started and get into the point where they understand. So that's what I see the national level. From, frankly, really strong support for it. Good, good. Thank you, gentlemen. Baja. Yes, sir. Battery Energy Storage System, BSS, BESS. Yes, sir. Um, it's an emerging technology. Tell, tell us a little bit more about that, and, and how, how can that help us? All right, so this, of course, with this technology, we are able to, again, harness and store the energy, like... To think simplifying it, uh, you just consider that you have a, a solar system installed and that uh, you are able to produce solar energy e a cert certain time of the day, of course, not all the day, and you, you, you lose that capability in, at the night, for example. So you, c you can uh, store that energy that you produce in the daytime and just you can use it in the nighttime. And it, in economic ways, another simple example that, you know, we, we have different kind of rates at different hours, just considering that you, you are an industrial establishment and or you are a, res a household, you can always store your energy when it's cheaper for you and to be deployed uh, when uh, it's in the peak hours, which is, means expensive. So, and also uh, at, the, at the grid level, uh, we can talk about uh, several technical benefits, which I don't want to get into details of, but uh, again, in simple terms, for example, we're talking about a peak shaving, which really helps a lot with the, with the general health of the uh, grid system, uh, getting rid of those uh, overloads in certain times, uh, and also uh, say economically, it 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 pays a lot because then the uh, utility companies doesn't have to invest uh, unnecessarily on the uh, expansion of the grid system or uh, the advancement of the grid system because of those peak hours. Mm. You you simply supply the system with more energy when it's needed uh, through the energy that you have stored. So. It has a lot of practical, uh, technical, and electrical, uh, economical uh, advantages. And uh, there are several uh, technologies uh, that uh, serves the purpose. Uh, we will be producing uh, LFP uh, cells, which is lithium ferrous phosphate. 
uh, which is a proven technology that every, uh, most of the industry relies on in means of safety as well. Uh, but there are other technologies as well. A lot of companies are working of, on uh, advancing these technologies and uh, uh, researching some new technologies uh, like uh, flow batteries and so forth. And uh, we, will, we will be also as Plomega uh, in an effort, in a non-stop effort of researching and developing our technologies to serve uh, different functions and different capacities. So uh, battery energy storage systems uh, have been very much available and affordable uh, since a few years. Uh, it's, it's a new market, it's a new industry. Uh, it's been around uh, uh, since about a little bit more than 10 years and it, it has been growing uh, exponentially since last three, four years. I mean, in very basic terms, uh, we have installed more capacity in the United States uh, last year that, than that was uh, installed uh, all in history. So uh, one year could, could just like double up all the capacity in a, in a country like United States, which is, which is really uh, has larger demands. Uh, it, is, it is evident that uh, this industry will get big, bigger and bigger because uh, most, most probably uh, most of the renewable energy installations will have storage facilities as well uh, besides uh, the uh, self-standing uh, self-storage facilities which were made uh, economically feasible uh, by the introduction of Inflation Reduction Act as well. Uh, so, in a nutshell, this is what they're doing. Gotcha. Thank you. Game changer, Tom. It is. Game it is a game changer. Guillaume, hurricane season. It's getting ready to hit. What can Snyder do? How, how can you help alleviate or diminish downtime? What, 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 what kind of technology are you guys working on? That, 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 that's a hard one because every time you say hurricane, everyone <laughs> picture what it impacts on, on our daily life. So it's, uh, uh, but look, looking at shortages, whether they are natural, right. disaster driven, right. or sometimes human uh, right. driven shortages. Uh, I was mentioning the other technology that we, we should be talking more about. It's everything that is related to microgrid. So basically being able to operate separated from a grid for a certain amount of time can be can be long lasting or it can be short lasting, but this ability to disconnect and still operate. Um, on this system, Schneider is going to provide the technology that is going to allow for the efficient implementation, deployment and, and operability of the microgrid. We're not going to do that alone. We're going to do that with generator manufacturers, with battery system manufacturers, with solar panel manufacturers. We're going to bring all these technologies together and build a brain that is going to operate this microgrid efficiently. And you can do that at every scale you want. So for the legislators, for the company operators in this room, you can picture, let me give you an example. We deployed a 12 megawatt microgrid system for the Navy base of uh, Miramar. Not, not only is it able to protect them should any natural disaster happen or even a cyber attack, you never know. So sure. they are protected, but they have enough generation, enough power to also support the community around. Now you can picture that downscale it to a, to, to a home. If you've put some solar panel and a battery system on your home, at home, we're creating automation systems that you can deploy at your home that will give you as a user very simple, simple mode of operation. Every given day, what you want if you have a smart pricing system where energy is more expensive at 2 p.m. than it is at, at 2 a.m., you might want to consume maximum solar energy at 2 p.m. when it's available, readily available, so, you, so it makes your bill cheaper, and switch to either your battery system or the grid at 2 a.m. When, when, when the price of energy is, is, uh, is cheaper. But let's now Imagine you get a text alert that tells you a storm is coming. And the storm will be huge and massive and with a probability of shortage coming in your area. 
Well, you could press just a simple button on your phone. You go to your app, your Schneider app, that controls all your equipment, and you tell them, prepare me for a storm. So now during the next three hours, it's going to, store, to, to stock up your battery to their maximum capabilities. So by the time the storm comes in, you are prepared. You have 24, 48 hours of energy. Your home is ready for it. This is a simple button. This is technology that you can deploy everywhere today. We, between the extreme of the 12 megawatt and the uh, couple of kilowatt of your home, we can deploy microgrid in a box that can be deployed at any site when there's an emergency situation, when a hurricane lands, you can bring this microgrid, plug a generator on it, and just repower a certain wow. zone. So all of this technology exists today. Wow, fantastic. All right, guys, three minutes. We've got two questions, all right? So keep them tight. <laughs> but the last one, I think, might be one of the most important. Steve, Duke nuclear short term. What you guys working on? So really, we, we think of it in, in three pieces, today, tomorrow, and the future. So the today is the operational excellence piece we talked about before. The tomorrow for us is subsequent license renewal. So, you know, plants built in the U.S. were originally licensed for 40 years. We've gone through license renewal and ex ex extended that to 60 years. But if we stop there, the six plants in South Carolina would have to shut down between 2031 and the last one would be in 2046. So we're going through a process now for subsequent license renewal to license the plants for 80 years so they'll all, all operate past the mid-century. And then the future for us, and it is, it is an all of the above approach, but, but my piece of it is nuclear and is, is obviously the small modular reactor piece that has been, uh, that has been referenced many times. And, and our expectation would be to to move forward uh, into that at the right time, and we'd expect to operate those assets just as well uh, as we do the assets today. So we're, we're on the front end of technology selection, site selection, and just starting to work through the process for, for permitting. Uh, but, but that'll be the, the path for the future. That's awesome. Keep that one going in Oconee, because y'all pay a lot of taxes. I don't want my taxes. Going. I understand. <laughs> um, we got just a few few minutes left, and, and this will be the last question. We're not going to have enough time to answer the crowd. But, gentlemen, here's an opportunity. you got decision makers sitting right in front of you. There's the lieutenant governor. I, the, the governor left, but his staff is here. If you can tell them right now, and I want to put you on the spot, but you've got an opportunity to say, here's what we need moving forward. And, and we're doing, South Carolina's doing a, a, amazing in, in streamlining a lot of things. But is there something that you can tell these policymakers, these decision makers right now, this is what would be extremely helpful for the business? I don't want to call on anybody, but raise your hand if there is anybody out there. So, so I would just, I think about electricity as a necessity, not a commodity. If you think about our ability, all of our abilities to deliver electricity in balance, affordable, reliable, and sustainable, it takes a structure to do that. If you think about that first, we're not on, people get hurt and businesses get harmed. And I think this y'all are d demonstrating how amazing when you're in balance on affordable, reliable, and sustainable, what happens. And I think that, that leads a lot of the policy, sorry, policy wonky stuff that I think about every day with that attitude. And y'all are obviously doing an amazing job. Awesome, Steve. I mean, I, I said earlier, I'm a plant guy, not a policy guy. But when I think about that question, the two things that that come to mind for me are we, we need favorable policy that will, will help us move forward. And then, and then we need positive stakeholder engagement and support to allow us to move forward. So those are the two things for me. Awesome. Yeah. Gentlemen? I, we have everything that we need for business, but I can speak for the industry. Uh, South Carolina is among the few states that didn't put out any uh, storage uh, goals yet. So uh, if uh, that will be made possible as a, as a guideline that will help uh, the storage industry to uh, kind of like equip South Carolina with storage even better. Fantastic. Dion? Two asks for, for all of you. The first one is, remember the story on the plant, 26% reduction in energy. Today, there's very little incentive for all of us to do it. We need to accelerate because this is a way to solve for the energy equation 
wet rain to sulfur together. And the second one for all of the policy makers or executive branch here, it's, uh, look, there's one thing that I'm looking at right now that concerns me every day is there's a large part of the population that will retire in the next five years. Mm. We need to build the skills of tomorrow. So please keep investing in your high schools, colleges, universities, train electricians, because if you have one thing that is common to all of us is we need electricians. Very good. Chris, last word, don't screw it up. Oh man, pressure. Uh, so, so I'll piggyback a little bit about uh, s and and, and Duke. For us, a big one is, is creating the enabling environment that allows us to compete for their technology selection, good. right? We, we wanna do that. We wanna bring our technology force forward, demonstrate that we think it's the best and, and work with you guys. So the environment that supports them going forward with nuclear is the environment that supports us bringing our technology to the world. Fantastic. Gentlemen, thank you. Lunch is on me. You did a great job. Let's give our panel a big, big hand. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, guys. What a great panel. Um, that was excellent. So lunch, speaking of lunch, this first door here, uh, if, if you'll exit out of the first door and the last door, there are two tables set up for lunch um, and you can go on both sides and feel free, enjoy lunch. And the governor and Congressman Duncan will be having a fireside chat um, here shortly. So thank you. <laughs>